Good afternoon, folks. Welcome to that Vid Blaster guy. I am Tom Sinclair, and I guess I'm that Vid Blaster guy today. Glad to have you. Let me get a graphic up there. There we go. And uh, really excited about today's show. We, uh, for those of you watching live, you know that we've got uh, that I'm on the Gulf Coast of of Alabama and that there is a hurricane right off the coast and it's uh, heading, almost heading our way. Uh, the real threat for us has been not this hurricane sitting off the coast, but the threat of a hurricane sitting off the coast that three days ago it was going to be enormous and it was going to be fast moving and it was going to just obliterate everything in its path. And so we scrambled all around and got ready. And, and of course now it's not going to be nearly as big. It's not moving nearly as quickly. Uh, which actually is a bad thing, but uh, it, it was just this morning declared a hurricane. So um, I'm not quite as ready for today's show as I, sh as I should be. I apologize to those of you for that. But I had a ter terrific interview with uh, Andrew Zarian yesterday. Um, and as you know, the, the theme for VidBlaster is that, that one guy can do, with, with one PC and the right software, VidBlaster, can do a pretty decent broadcast. And so we're trying to do all of this on one PC um, and you know one mixer, one keyboard, one, one mouse, all that kind of thing. And that each show is, is generally on one of three topics. Either we're gonna talk about sports broadcasting, uh, church broadcasting, or talk show broadcasting. And today's show is gonna be about talk show broadcasting. Um, we are we are out of the betas. We started out our first show was an alpha show. It wasn't very well done. The second show was an alpha show, and it was done a little better. The first the next three or four shows were sort of betas, and we're out of the alphas. We're out of the betas. We're into the release versions of that vid blaster guy. And I wanted to wait um, and get some of my my big names on for the the real show. And I'm delighted that Andrew Syrian. Uh, of the guys from Queens Network had agreed to come on. We actually taped the interview yesterday, as, as you may recall if you watch the show regularly. I taped the interviews in advance. Again, still trying to make sure I get everything just right. Eventually we will go to live interviews, um, and that'll be a lot of fun too, but for right now we're, we're sort of taping them in advance. And so Andrew and I got a chance to chat yesterday as, as we were, uh, as we were waiting for this storm to decide what it was gonna do. Um, and I will tell you also that I had pre-recorded some tutorials for today that we were going to play in advance. And again, with this hurricane coming in, I was a little frazzled. And uh, but they were really good tutorials. I'll tell you, they really were good. I was spot on. I, I had everything right. And uh, then as I g got through both of them and was getting ready to start pre-show here a little while ago, I realized that I didn't have any volume on either one of them. So we'll play one of them and see how it goes. So, you know, the best laid plans of mice and men. I guess that's what happens when you've got one guy uh, and he doesn't have his wife staying over, standing over saying, remember to turn up the sound, remember to start the recorder. Uh, I did start the recorder, by the way. Um, so that's the, that's the thing. And I appreciate those of you that are joining us live in the chat room. For those of you that are watching us uh, on, on delay, um, you're welcome to join us Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Central Time and join us in the chat as well. And uh, I'm getting some good feedback from the chat folks on the video size, which is interesting. We'll have to talk about that. But I did have a chance to talk with Andrew Zarian. Andrew is the president and founder of the International Association of Internet Broadcasters, um, which is a fairly recent organization intended for folks that are doing what we do. and and. And so we'll talk some more with him about that. He's also the, the president and CEO of the Guys from Queens Network. And so I'm not gonna steal his thunder. I'm gonna let him tell you about that. So with no further ado, let's, uh, let's have a listen to Andrew Zarian and the Guys from Queens Network in our interview yesterday. And Andrew, welcome to the show. Glad to have you, man. Hey, Tom, thanks for having me. Tell you what, it is a real treat to have you on the show, and I really appreciate it. I hope you're not offended that you had to wait till show seven to get on, but I really wanted to make sure that at least technically we'd worked out a lot of the bugs before we asked you to get on. Because the last thing I want to do is come on and have audio issues or something like that. 
<laughs> no, I know how it is. I mean, we, we, we've produced many, many shows and, uh, you know, you got to go through the betas and the alphas until you get everything going right. And uh, that's when you go live and you bring in, you know, the guests that you don't, that you know will tolerate if there's a problem. Yes. Yes. Well, I, I appreciate you being really, really gracious and, and coming on the show. I, I, I really want to know, and, and folks have asked me the question, and I want to deflect the question to you. How in the world did you get into this wonderful world of webcasting or video podcasting or what? What are we going to call it? We got to come up with a name, something. I, I like I like internet broadcasting the best. Okay. That's my favorite. Okay, that works. I like that. Well, how did you get into internet broadcasting? Uh, I it's actually a, a, an insane story. Uh, I don't have a broadcasting past. I was always a fan of radio growing up. Uh, I actually would rather listen to the radio than to actually watch television. So I, I always liked the the aspect of, you know, talk radio. So I got laid off from my job, which was an awful thing because it came at the wrong time. I had just bought a house. I had just gotten married, bought a car. I had a great IT job, and the company started doing layoffs, and I was one of the last ones in, so I was the first one out. Ouch. So sitting at home, and I, I really don't know what I'm going to do next. I'm trying to pick up the pieces of, of what, what was left and uh, I discovered podcasts because I had some free time and uh, one of my buddies he's a stand up comic and he told me you know why don't we try this why don't we try doing a, a podcast and that's how we started we started doing uh, the awful awful shows I, I just want to tell you with awful USB mics uh, just really from the ground up we would actually do it via Skype where he would sit in one end of the house on Skype and he would Skype me and I would be in my office and we would record the conversation via Skype. It was just awful quality. And I realized that I actually enjoyed doing this. So I got a new mixer, I bought a microphone, uh, then we started going live, and then we discovered VidBlaster, and we just put everything together from that point on. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. So prior to, prior to discovering VidBlaster, you guys were audio only? No, we actually went, vid we always started with video. Okay. What we would do, uh, actually, when we no, you're right. When we were doing our podcast, our, our Skype calls, that was audio only. We never released it to anybody. It was just for us to see if this is something we're gonna like. Uh, but our first official show was a live show. We did it on Stickham, and we just streamed the video directly to them. I think through FMA. Okay. Okay. And then VidBlaster was right at. I mean, right around that time, we discovered VidBlaster, and we started using it. So, so VidBlaster was sort of the missing link then for you guys to be able to now did you have I remember some of you, some of your shows from I guess maybe a year 18 months ago um, you had a couple of people in the same room you had multiple cameras multiple mics um, that was a, a, a studio that you had somewhere in an office building no no the studio has always been been in my in in my house I, I built a studio in the house and we still have i mean all the setup is here we just recently redid everything uh we'll generally have you know four people in studio uh when we have you know an in-studio show uh so we we you know built the studio from there where we you know we pieced everything together we started off with just putting up a piece of felt and covering up the the my office that i was in and then we painted and we put, you know, things on the wall and now we're in this studio. When you say we, it sounds like you've got uh, a bunch of co-conspirators. Uh, I have a lot of people that work with me. We have about 15 co-hosts oh, that wow. do shows for us. Okay. Uh, and we have about four people that work behind the scenes that are part of, you know, let's say management. Okay. Uh, we have editors, we have uh, live streaming engineers, we have a COO. So we... we that this this crazy thing has become a full uh, full fledged company. At what point in this process did you guys suddenly realize you really had something unique? Yeah, you know, my wife always jokes and uh, and and tells people. People always ask her like, "How did this happen?" You know, he, one minute he's doing he's working in an office, and next you know he's working from home. And she always says that when when I started doing it, she thought it would be a two week thing. She thought I would do this for a couple of weeks and I would say, OK, it was fun, but I got to go do something else. But we it, it kind of caught us off guard because I started doing it and I was sitting at home and I couldn't find a job at the time because the economy had tanked. And it just it just slowly turned into it where we added more shows. One show became two, two became four. Uh, and I believe it was 
January 2010, we got our first advertisement. So within a year of doing it, we had our first ad. And that's when we realized, hey, this is something that's actually going to generate some sort of income. Uh, might as well continue it and see where it goes. And, you know, four years later, we're, we're still doing it. Awesome. Awesome. And, and so how many shows have you got going now? Uh, right now we have 14 shows. Wow. Uh, almost every day. We're off on Saturdays. That's the only day that we don't have shows. Uh, and it's everything from technology to hair loss. I mean, we cover everything on the network. So you're looking for new shows? You're looking we're for always new looking ideas? for new shows. Yeah, we're always looking for new content. We're always looking for new shows. Uh, the issue has always been that I'm, I'm the producer, so it has to revolve around my schedule. So a lot of the times, you know, in the mornings, I'm dealing with a lot of the business stuff, so I can't sit and produce a show in the mornings. Right. So generally, everything starts after 4 or 5 o'clock, and it continues to about 10 o'clock. So if somebody wants you to produce a show for them, they, they have to be in the New York area? No, uh, we, we try to actually we do try to keep everything local and we do try to keep everything in house. I think when you're in the studio, it, it's more of an intimate feel uh, and, and it seems like everything is uniformed in some way. Uh, but we do have some Skype shows. We, we just uh, we're actually going to start doing uh, this week in Radio Tech with Kirk Harnack. Uh, he was formerly on the Twit Network. He's joining us now and he's going to be broadcasting a show on GFQ and that starts in about a week. So, yeah, we're, we're always looking for shows. You know, there's no strict rules as far as coming in studio or being outside. It's just whatever works, works for us. Gotcha. 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 So if I'm sitting at home right now and I'm watching this show and I'm looking at you and I'm hearing you talk about your 14 shows and your advertisers and I'm thinking, you know, this is pretty good. I can start this and within a year or two, I'll be pulling down 100 G's, right? Uh, I hope you will. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. It's a tough thing, uh, you know, finding the ads, it's the, it's the hardest thing. I always, uh, it, it's 50% talent and 50% luck in my opinion. You really got to make the right connections and they have to like you. Right. You know, we have Hover as a, our main advertiser. We have Audible as a main advertiser. And, you know, I don't necessarily, 50% uh, of the time, I think they actually advertise because they actually like me as a person. Right. Uh, and I've built this relationship with them. I think that goes a long way. Right. Your content, yes, that, that definitely depends on that. But the 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 one on one relationship you develop with potential advertisers and potential partners is what keeps them around. Well, how about a couple of shameless plugs for them right now then? Uh, yeah, we have Hover.com as our, as our main advertiser. We have Audible. Uh, we've you know we've worked with uh, a, a lot of the main companies you know that you see on podcasts. We we've, we've worked with them in some capacity. Very cool. Very cool. So, what? Tell me a little bit more. I mean, obviously, this is a vid blaster show, so we do want to kind of weave that through here. Um, tell tell me what part of your process you're using vid blaster for. I, I know we talked before the show that you you have gone beyond the Tom Sinclair ideal of one man, one PC, um, <laughs> and and you you've divided up the processes. Uh, so share, share with us a little bit about that and where VidBlaster plugs into that. Sure. So what we do, uh, we've been using VidBlaster for a long time now, and we realize that it, it, it's an amazing software, but there's only so much you can do on one computer. Uh, it, 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 it requires a lot of resources, especially when you're doing high-def video and you're recording and you're streaming and you're Skyping in. So we've, we've kind of split everything off. So VidBlaster is primarily a recording box and our video switching box. So that's all it does. We don't do Skype on it. We don't do uh, streaming on it. We don't send to the CDNs. Uh, so we take the VidBlaster video and we take the video out from our video card and we tap it into another machine and that's our encoding machine. And that sends everything to the CDNs, to the Justins, Ustream, Stickham, and whoever else we're broadcasting with. Uh, we have a third computer next to me and that's our Skype machine. And that goes right back into the VidBlaster machine and we're using a Blackmagic Intensity Pro to capture that video, and that's what you'll see when we have a Skype guest on. Okay. Uh, on top of, you know, the four cameras that we have in the studio. Uh, then we route the audio out of the computer, and we have a computer behind me here just for our audio stream, because we provide an audio stream as well. So we've kind of split the workload off uh, amongst, you know, four or five different computers. And Tom and I were speaking prior to uh, doing a show, and he was saying, you know, it doesn't need to be that complicated. And I totally agree with you, Tom. It doesn't need to be that complicated. 
I think for uh, someone that does, you know, one show a week or two shows a week, and they're not, you know, constantly replaying the show, I think you can manage this on all on one computer. It's was, totally possible. I had an opportunity this past week to uh, pop through North Carolina on the way home from a, a family vacation and popped in on Amnon Nissan with Nissan Communications and Mike Phillips. Sure, uh, good there. guys, both of them. And, and got to meet them in person, which was really a thrill for me. Um, and I'm sure it was a real thrill for Mike too, um, to meet me. But uh, he was talking about uh, the Beatles and mm -hmm. somebody that was interviewing, one of the, uh, interviewing Paul McCartney and asking how they were able to do such complicated things with their music. And he said, basically, as we start with a complicated idea and then we simplify it to its absolute base and then we build back on that. But only when we can absolutely perfect it at the simple do we increase the, the complication of it. Oh, I, I agree with that. I agree with that 100%. You know, when we initially started, uh, we started off with one stream and then we added another one and we added another one. And we were adding a computer per stream because uh -huh. we were running Flash Media Encoder on them. So each video, each uh, stream, so let's say we had five streams, had a dedicated computer that was pumping out the video to them. So you could imagine in this room, we had five, six, seven, we had about 12 computers at one point. Holy cow. To manage it. But, you right. know, technology gets better and software gets better. And, right. you know, we've kind of brought it down to, uh, to one computer to stream out the video to everything. Gotcha, gotcha. How do you handle the heat? Doesn't it get hot in uh, here? It gets really hot, and, and there are days that it's so brutal in here. Uh, I, I'm not a sweater, so you, people don't really notice it, but we hit, uh, I think it was late June, we hit 101 degrees in the studio while doing the show. Inside? Inside, inside the studio. I mean, we're in the oh, 90s goodness. almost every show during the summer. Oh my goodness. I don't think we'll, we'll drop below 92 on any given day. I mean, it's nearly impossible, but we, you know, we, we try to keep it cool as much as we can prior to the show. Right. We can't run air conditioners. That's the big problem. Ah, uh, because of the background noise. Yeah, yeah, that's a big uh, problem. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, for the folks that are watching, tell me a little bit about your, your audio setup and your, and your video setup. What, what kind of mic are you using right now? So I'm using a Electro Voice Cardinal. And people ask me all the time, you know, oh, that must be an expensive mic. It's not an expensive mic at all. Uh, it's about a hundred bucks now. I paid about two hundred when I got a new about four years ago. But it's it's a fairly inexpensive mic. It's a condenser mic, but it works really well because if I'm off mic, you really can't hear me. Uh, that's really the primary reason why I got it. But I'm also using uh, preamp and pro I'm using preamp processors. I'm using uh, for each mic in the studio, which is four mics. We're using uh, DBX two eighty six S mic preamp uh, processors. And we don't use too much processing on it, a little bit of compression. But the primary reason why we get this, and I recommend this to anybody getting into internet broadcasting, is the gate limiter. So if I'm not speaking, it shuts my mic off. So you don't hear any background noise. So if you want, if you want Tom, I could demonstrate what it'll sound like. I don't know if you'll hear it, but I could turn the gate off and you could hear all the noise. All right, go ahead. I don't know if you could hear it, but now my mic lost a lot of its its boom uh and, and i could hear in my headphones i could hear a lot of the room noise and the air conditioner going into the other room but if i turn this off there comes the presence of the audio so it's an amazing unit it, it's fairly i mean it's not that expensive when you're talking about hardware i mean 200 bucks for the unit i mean that's not bad no nope. no nope. so we use four of those uh and it's a great it's a great piece of hardware. Uh, then we're using a Mackie 1402 VLZ3 as the mixer, the primary mixer. And, uh, and that's about it. I mean, that's all the audio processing that we're doing. We're not doing any uh, software processing. Uh, and everything goes into a M-Audio sound card on the main computer and straight into VidBlaster. Okay. 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 And what about on the video side? On the video side, I'm using a Canon HF20 uh, camcorder. It's about four years old. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it. I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it to anybody. It does <laughs> awful in low light situations. Uh, and, and it's probably one of the my least favorite pieces of hardware in my studio. But for whatever reason, with the positioning of this camera and the lighting being positioned behind behind it, it does a pretty decent job at the low light situation. Oh, you look uh, great. 
Yeah, I'm actually quite surprised how good it's it's come out. Uh, prior to getting this lighting, it was awful. I mean, just the white balance. It does not like certain types of lighting, but for whatever reason, with this lighting, it works, and I'm not touching it at that point. If it works, it works. Yep. Uh, we also use uh, two life cam cinemas as uh, webcams as our second and third shot, and we use a, can a Logitech C910 for the coho shot. Okay. Okay. So it's a mixed environment. You know, we have webcams and we have um, regular, you know, camcorders. And then we're using Blackmagic Intensity Pro capture cards, three of them in the main box, to bring in our Skype video, two Skype videos, and my camera. Gotcha. Gotcha. I notice your background, your backdrop is actually live. It's not, uh, you're not using a green screen, are you? No, no, no green screen. It's live. I could, um, I could even manipulate the camera and change the lighting. So I could change the lighting depending on the show. So uh, I can make it red, I can make it blue. <laughs> it's a cool little uh, thing I got from Ikea for like 50 bucks. <laughs> well, I can't do that. I'd have to get a different backdrop in order to do that. <laughs> I've, I've actually had uh, really bad experiences with green screen. Really? Your, yours looks phenomenal, but I don't have the space. I don't know how far you, your distance is with the screen and you, but I could literally touch this wall if I wanted to. I don't have that much room here. I'm about uh, I'm about four feet away from the back wall. Wow, and that looks great. Yeah, that looks phenomenal. And I've got just a halo of lights, lighting the screen, and then lighting me as well. I mean, you can tell when I you can t tell where the lights are by where the shadows are. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it's it's really an uphill battle that we face as internet broadcasters because we don't have a large budget to work with. You know, some do. I mean, the Leo Laportes of the world do, the Adam Carollas do, but you know. Tom and myself, I mean, we're trying to piece it together as we go along. So it, it's amazing that when you when you listen to a show with, with somebody that's been doing this and using the software that you're using, you'll always find out something new and uh, that may or, you know, change your entire perception of what you're doing. Well, and you not coming from a, a broadcasting background, and I certainly don't come from a broadcasting background. Um, I'm just watching TV. I'm watching ESPN and I'm saying, how can I make what I want to do look like that? Yeah. And, you know, how can I make a talk show look decent so that I don't have a, sh a shadow on my, my head and have gr a green halo on my shoulders from the green screen sure. behind me? Um, I, I, think, I think it also, the technology has come such a long way over the last five years. I mean, you look at where VidBlaster was five years ago, four years ago. Sure. To now. I mean, it, it, it's improved drastically. Yes. And... It just it amazes me that we're able to put on network quality in t in certain situations better than network quality broadcasts via you know a computer and 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 one piece of software. Yes, I mean it's totally possible. You can do it if you get if you invest it into the hardware, and it's going to be the fraction of the cost that it would cost the networks to put put out something. Oh, no doubt. It, it's amazing to me. I mean that that whole thing just blows my mind that we've come such a long way with the technology that we're using right now. So, Andrew, have you thought about uh, putting any of your shows on the local cable channel? Uh, you know, I, I know somebody that works for the public access uh, here in Queens, and they always ask me, like, oh, why don't you put on public access? But I, I don't know if it does any good, you know, other than putting it on a local channel uh, in the area. I, I think the Internet is really the way to go. You I may pick up a couple of viewers here and there, but... I don't know. I don't know what I got to deal with. I don't know what kind of agreements I got to sign. Uh, so I stick exclusively to the internet. Uh, I think there's a there's a place for this. I think this is where entertainment is headed. Uh, you know, I have two younger brothers, and they neither one of them watches television. They watch everything on their computers. So wow. that's obviously a sign of where we're headed. Right. Right. Uh, and I think this is how people are going to get their entertainment. And and I think niche programming will be. An ama we'll have an amazing presence on the internet because for every ridiculous topic you think you want to discuss, there's somebody that you are catering to. Where on the networks, that really doesn't work that well. Right. You right. can't have niche programming on you know a cable channel that's investing money into your show. Certainly, certainly. Well, when the when the threshold for entry is as low as it is for internet broadcasting, anyone with a passion for a particular subject, and a little bit of hard work can put themselves on wherever they want. 
It, sure. It's yeah, amazing. you're absolutely right. I, I think you know that there's there's a place for everybody. And uh, I had this discussion with somebody recently about competition. Uh, he was going on at the same time as somebody else, and he was saying how the other guy said, "Oh, we're competing now." And and I don't agree with that. I don't think there's any competition on the internet when it comes to this. It's whoever whoever's doing the better broadcast will get the more viewers. I don't think the time slots matter because everything is on demand. Everything is on podcast form. Um, and everybody has their niche audience. And I think there's so much room for everybody to kind of coexist in this, in this internet broadcasting world. So that, that's, that brings up a good question. Obviously, you guys are doing all your shows live and you're recording them um, and you're making them available. How, how, I guess somebody would go to your website and you've got a, a video on demand section. Uh, what are the numbers on live versus video demand? Uh, you know, I, I love live and I wish live was my bread and butter, but it's not. Um, advertisers don't necessarily embrace live as much as they do with downloads because there's no proper statistics currently that can measure live numbers. Uh, unless you're working directly with the CDNs that are going to give you exclusively, you know, uniques, non-uniques, returns, demos. Uh, it's nearly impossible to kind of measure what you're doing with that. But as far as downloads go, uh, that's where my money is made. So I would have to say, yeah, d downloads are what matters right now. But I would like to see it kind of shift because I think we live has a unique feel to it. And I think you could do a lot more with live than you can with on demand. I think the relationship you build with your audience when you're broadcasting live and you have a chat room right. uh, really goes a long way. But I think there's a place for both. Um, you know, as far as the advertisers go currently, no, there's only one place and that's on demand. Interesting, interesting. You know, coming from a sports broadcasting standpoint, uh, the exact opposite is true. Yeah, you need live. Because the, the majority of your viewers are live. They want to yeah. see it's a unique event. Uh, if it's a basketball game or a football game or a soccer match, whatever. Um, when that event has concluded and the score is known, the desire to go back and watch the game is diminished greatly. Absolutely. Um, and uh, the perfect example is I do not want to watch. I'll, I'll watch. I don't want to watch the Mets play anyway because they lose all the time. But... I don't want to watch them lose five hours later. Right. You know, I have no desire to watch sports on demand, and I think that's really um, it, it's an anomaly in the in the world of uh, in the world of television because everything is going on demand and everything is pre-recorded right. now. Right. But sports is really you know it just shows you people want to be connected with what's happening at that moment, and that's why I, I personally believe in live. Absolutely, absolutely. I was talking to a friend who has a company that streams sporting events. And they were streaming a, uh, a preseason football game in Mississippi. And they had a live audience of over 3,000 wow. computers. Now, that's computers. Wow. Yeah. You know, we don't know how many folks are, are tuned in to any single computer. But they were getting feedback. And again, keep in mind, this is Mississippi. Everybody thinks about, and I'm in Alabama, so I know. But everybody thinks about Mississippi and Alabama as being, you know, Red dirt roads and pickup trucks. No, but you guys have college. You guys have high school and college football. Oh. You guys are have have that. We don't have that in New York. We we have we have football. There's no yeah. doubt about that. We and don't have high school. I mean, there's no high school football here. Really? Yeah. Really. I, the New York City public schools. I, I mean, my I went to a school with no football team for about 30 years, and and they just added one. But it doesn't have that same feel. I think that connection that you know smaller towns are able to create with their football teams mean a lot. I mean, Friday Night Lights was a great example of that. Right, right, right. And I think that that's why there's a place for this. You know, that's why you're able to present a high school football game with Vidblaster and get 3,000 people that'll tune in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that's, my, that's amazing. That's amazing to me. Well, and, and I think that's good. And, and from what I hear in Texas, that, that's a low number. The folks that's a very Texas low number are, in are Texas. Crazy yeah. about I, I actually have relatives there and they're, they're I mean, there's some place for the football team, and the guy is like a superstar in town. It's my, it's amazing to me. Yeah, I do, I do an internet show with, with you know, a couple hundred thousand people that watch weekly, and I don't get that. <laughs> well, you know, we don't want to peak too soon. You know, when you, <laughs> if you peak as a 17-year-old, it's all just all downhill from there. You know, my wife says that to me all the time. She says I peaked when I was 17. That's funny. Oh golly. <laughs> well, I doubt if that's the case. Oh, I'm but but it's, it, it's fascinating to me, Mike. Now, uh, what, what Mike has done, uh, I should say, is fascinating because he took the software and he, he, 
he came up with it with something else. He was doing an audio uh, version. Of, All right, now of you're talking about Mike doing. Verstig, the developer Verstig, of Vid Blaster now. The creator right. of Vid Blaster, yeah. Right. And, and how he was able to develop it into video it, it was, is amazing to me. Uh, and, it, and it works. I mean, we've been doing it for three, four years now. I discovered Vid Blaster quite by accident in February of 2009. And I knew that something like Vid Blaster had to be out there somewhere. The, the computer world was too big. There were too many folks doing cool things. There had to be something. And I couldn't, I mean, I didn't know about TriCaster. I didn't know about Wirecast. I didn't know about Vid Blaster. I didn't know about XSplit or, or any of these, vMix or any of these others. It just, but I knew there had to be something there. And I, I spent literally six months off and on Googling every possible word combination I could, but it was just, all of it was below the radar. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and it was kind of the same thing for me when we started, you know, we realized we got to outgrow Flash Media Encoder and go to something else. I, I mean, I couldn't find the right, proper word combination to find something. Right, right. And it just so happened that somebody, I, I, it was a forum for video cards. And somebody mentioned Vid Blaster. They were using Vid Blaster. And I Googled it and I found it. I said, wow, this is great. I didn't even use it. I, I used the trial for about three hours. And then I bought the software. Oh, because wow. I, the interface sold the software for me. Yes. The modular aspect of the software is really has gone far for me. And I actually like to know what I'm doing and click on the right buttons rather than you know spending 15 minutes trying to find the right combination. I think it's really self-explanatory. Uh, of itself and uh, it works well. It, it really does have a pretty slow, easy learning curve, at least for the simple stuff. Now, have um, you noticed that the other software that you've used, anything else, it's a little bit more difficult to learn? Uh, I, I made a, a bona fide 100% <clears throat> excuse me, attempt to learn Wirecast. And how'd that go for you? And, and I just, I couldn't get it. I'm, I'm sure, that I was expecting it to do things in a particular way, and it just wouldn't do them that way. I, th I think they're both really good software. I, I, I both of them do a great job at it. I think depending on what your need is. Well, I think it depends on what your other. background is, Andrew. Yeah. If you're coming from a, a non-broadcast background, I think Vid Blaster is is perfect because it's all out there. It's simple. You just want to do it. You click on it. Where somebody coming from a broadcast background may say, oh, well, I, you know, I want to build a shot in layers uh, or sure. whatever that uh, Wirecast uses that probably is a very sensible, logical way to do it. But if you've never done it before, it, uh, it I don't know. Well, I'll have to get Joe DeMax on the show sometime to talk about yeah, he, Wirecast. Yeah, he's the, uh, the Wirecast expert. So uh, if I have a Wirecast question, I go to him. Um, you know, I, I like both. I, I think, you know, the Wirecast machine currently serves as my as my encoding box, and uh -huh. I think that's because you're able to do four or five streams on that. I think it's very difficult when you're trying to switch cameras with VidBlaster, record the cameras, and you know send it to the CDNs. I think you'll encounter some problems there if you're doing HD. If you're not, maybe it might work, but we're also doing high-def video, right. and that really sucks up a lot of the resources. Right, right. I think the most I've ever been able to do is to, uh, to record um, right now we're coming to you um, 864 by 480 um, at uh, I think 25 or 30 frames a second. Um, and I've recorded that and then I've sent video out in VidBlaster's new VVD and had three Skype sessions, excuse me, three um, uh, Flash Media Live encoder sessions going. One that was audio only, and two that were video. Um, one was a, a full resolution video, and the other was a, a reduced resolution video. And you know, I'm, I've got an i7, uh, 2600K, so I was probably using 80%. Um, and I'm sure there were some cores that that were coming close to the max on, on yeah. that. But it worked. Yeah. It, and it was one PC. It was a sports broadcast, and we were switching three cameras. It was, it you, you know, it, it, it's still in its infancy, all this technology, and it's always, you know, a little bit of crossing your fingers and hoping it stays stable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that also plays a part in it. Yes, yes, indeed. Now, before I let you go, I, I, I got to hear about this Internet connection you've got, because this is just 
what everybody drools over from what I hear. You've got like a, a thousand gigabits or something incredible. Uh, we, I, I wish it was a thousand gigabits. I have, uh, we have, I have Verizon FiOS here and we have two FiOS lines and a backup DSL line through Verizon as well. And our main line is a 150 by 75 upload uh, internet connection. It's, it's stellar, I mean, really fast. We have a 50 by 50 also as our Skype machine and a backup in the studio. And we just have a standard, yeah, I think it's like one or two megabit uh, DSL line, just in case we still need to go online if something goes wrong. But for, if it wasn't for Verizon Fios, I don't think I'd be able to do what I'm doing right now. And you must pay, what? Three thousand dollars a month for that? Uh, no, no. I actually pay, I believe, ninety bucks for the one fifty by seventy five, or eighty bucks. Oh my and gosh. my other one is thirty nine ninety nine, the fifty by fifty. That is incredible. Yeah, and the DSL is nothing. It's like twenty bucks. Yeah. Wow. And, and that that's really changed the game. I think with higher internet speeds. People are going to be able to produce higher quality video right. for live programming. Right. If I just did on demand, I really wouldn't need, you know, all that all that bandwidth. I think I could be fine with 10 megabits upload and just do Skype interviews. Right. But because we do live video, right, we need as much speed as we we could get. I would like to get in a third line in here, just wow. for a third, you know, to split the CDNs off because I don't like kind of pushing everything out on one one thing. Um, but the good thing about Verizon is that they don't cap you and they don't look at what you're doing. So if you're uploading, I mean, we're uploading technically with all the five CDNs, we're uploading five megabits a second every second of the day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Holy cow. That's a lot of data going through. I guess so. And they've never, they've never, I mean, even said a word. So, all right, so somebody's out there doing all the calculations and they're figuring this up and they're saying, okay, HD, I want to do an HD stream. How much internet do I need to do that? I would recommend for each stream that you do at least one, I mean, and I'm low, at least one megabit upload, oh, one megabit uh, bit stream uh, for, your, for your video. Okay. I would go up as much, I mean, I think optimal, I think what you should be at is about 1.5 okay. uh, megabits per second upload uh, for your video. Uh, I mean, you could go higher, you could go to two, you could go to three, I mean, it'll look stellar. Right. But most people, you have to also put into consideration, most people don't have a consistent enough internet connection right. to sustain that, that, that you know, throughput. Right. So a lot of people, even though people say, well, no, I got 12 megs, I got 15 megabit download, why, well, why can't I watch it? It's because it's not consistent. It's not a good line. So right. the lower you go, the more of a chance more people are going to be able to watch a show. Well, and there's certainly other parts of the of the chain that uh, may not have that consistency. You might have it from your CDN, uh, from you to the CDN, or from their ISP to them, but somewhere along the line. Oh yeah, I mean, if you have an older router, it may not work properly. If, if I have, you know, if I'm having some sort of router issues, if you're having packet loss. There's so much that goes into the equation. It's not like television where it's, you know, a satellite pointing and here we go, you're magically on the air. Right. It, it requires, there's so many steps in the, in the process of getting online and having a consistent broadcast where anything could go wrong. Um, but if it's consistent, I mean, you can make it look really good. So for you, the sweet spot on HD is one megabit a second. We're doing a little more. We're doing about one point, uh, I want to say 1.4. Okay. For our HD stream. Now, we okay. also provide an, eight, you know, an SD stream, which is 864 by 480. Right. And that's about 800, 900 megabits a second. And then we offer okay. a fourth one at 500 megabits a second, just so we could say, okay, you know what? If you have not so good bandwidth or if you have great bandwidth, you could still watch us. You pick whatever stream you want to watch. Right. Like. Right, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Very cool, very cool. All right, well, I, I, I'm conscious of your time because I don't want to take up your whole, whole day, but I, I do have to ask you about the International Association of Internet Broadcasters, this, yeah, this creation IIB. that you have birthed. Uh, I'm a co-founder of the IIB, and we created it so it, it, to, to have a home for internet broadcasters. You know, there's a lot of people asking questions regardless if it's VidBlaster or Wirecast or if it's just an audio recommendation, uh, we created this place so it's the centralized hub for all things internet broadcasting. 
Uh, you could sign up. Uh, we have membership. We don't have any fees. There's no dues. It's open to all types of internet broadcasters. You could sign up and be a member. But we also have a forum, which is the, the, the lifeline of our website. Uh, you go to our website, you sign up for the forum, and you can ask whatever question you want. And we have such an amazing group of people there. We have a lot of active users. And within a couple minutes, you know, someone will answer your question. And I think that's what this industry needs. There's a lot of questions, but nobody's answering them. Uh, so it becomes an open debate. You know, one guy asked, uh, he wants to get a, a, an SM7 uh, microphone. And he posted, and this guy goes, I love it. And there's another guy that came in and said, no, this is why I don't like it. You should get an RE20. So right. there's always going to be different answers. And I think that's great. I, I think that we have options. And, and it's amazing that so many people are involved in the industry where they're going to take the time and answer your questions. So that's what the IIB does. We also have a IIB spotlight interview. So we interview internet broadcasters every Friday. Uh, and we're growing from there. We have a lot of things uh, coming up, and we're going to be announcing a couple partnerships we have with uh, industry leaders, uh, and that should be coming up in a couple months too. And that's ibroadcastnetwork.org? ibroadcastnetwork.org is the website. Okay, yeah. and from there you can get to the forum. You get to the forum, yeah. And you can sign up as a member. Yeah, you you got to sign up twice because the forum is kept separate from the main site. We wanted to have some sort of separation between the two. So if you sign up for the website, take the time, sign up for the forum as well. And I think I joined back in, in March or April. I, I forget how it got on my radar, but as soon as I saw it, I said, this is it. This is great. Yeah, and you post um, in there. Um, you know, whenever there's a vid blaster thing, you're, you're always posting it in there, and it causes, you know, a discussion, which is great. <laughs> a discussion. Uh, you know, yeah. some people have stuff to say about it. Some people love it. Uh, but that's the whole key to it. You know, it, it's it's connecting with uh, the 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 user base. And you, yeah. uh, you know, you, you work with a lot of people that use vid blaster. It's gr it's good for you to see, you know, what people are thinking and what they like and don't like. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the only way that you continue good. growth is, is getting feedback. It, it, and, and I love hearing from folks that, that have tried VidBlaster and have chosen something else for, for a reason. I like knowing what that reason is to see if it's, whether if it was a knowledge issue, something that they couldn't figure out and they just needed a little extra training, or whether it was a feature that VidBlaster didn't have, or whether it was a third category of, of reasoning. Um, because sometimes you can fix that and sometimes you can't. I, I, I've said this a couple times uh, uh, on, on my show, and uh, I like a lot of the other guys, but one of the reasons why I feel that they may get a, a little bit more attention than VidBlaster is because VidBlaster is very difficult to pirate. And I really? think a lot of the younger guys that don't like VidBlaster don't like it because they weren't able to go and pirate the software. They couldn't crack it. Yeah. They couldn't crack the software, and that—that's my thing, and that, that's great, you know, for the software because you know what? As a paying customer, I paid a lot of money for the software, and I really, I, I almost feel insulted when guys are running cracked versions of it, and or that I find out that they are. Yeah. Uh, so making it difficult is is a good thing, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. That's a whole perspective I hadn't considered. Thank you for yeah. that. Thank you for that. Well, Andrew, I really, man, I think our time is drawing to a close. I've come up with, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm out of good questions, at least for this time. I think five minutes after we conclude this interview, I'm going to say, oh, man, I wish I'd asked him this. <laughs> I wish I'd asked him that. So you, you got to promise me that, that you'll come back on the show again in 100%. the future. hundred percent. I'll definitely come on whenever, whenever you, you invite me back. I had good. a great time. Good. And uh, all right, let me get this URL. Uh, give us the URL for, uh, for your, your website because I, sh I, I should have put it on there and I didn't have it. So my, uh, my internet broadcasting network is called the GFQ Network, Guys from Queens Network. We're from Queens, New York. Uh, not all of us, so now we've, we've become the GFQ Network, and we broadcast uh, Monday, Sunday through uh, Friday. Every day we're on. We have a schedule on our website at gfqnetwork.com. You can watch live at gfqlive.tv. Uh, we have a great chat room there. People interact with each other. We, uh, during our shows, they yell at me. They tell me my mic is loud. They tell me my video's off. Uh, so there's a lot of happening over there, and my uh, my other organi my other organization is the International Association of Internet Broadcasters, uh, and uh, it is the centralized hub for all things internet broadcasting. Outstanding, outstanding, folks. This has been Andrew Zarian from the Guys from Queens Network, and and we're going to look back in um, you know five years, ten years, something like that. We're going to say this guy was the was the cutting edge guy 
of internet broadcasting. Yeah, I know there's Leo out there in California, but he didn't start internet. He started radio. And we're going to look at Andrew and we're going to say, this is the guy that cracked the code and, and got everybody going. So, you know, I, I really appreciate that because most of the time when people look at me, they just say, who's the magician? <laughs> well, I understand. I understand. And if it's any consolation, uh, we hope to have a bona fide mag magician on it as our guest in the next week or two. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brian Brushwood is has uh, Brian. I know Brian on. really well. He's he's a great, great, great guy. Well, and, and Brian was one of those that you know he was doing stuff with VidBlaster before it was cool. Um, yeah. You know he was the one that cra cracked the the Skype code, I think. Um, yeah, and, yeah, he did actually. He um, Brian was using it before I was, and we actually bonded over the fact that we we're using VidBlaster. And uh, he's a great dude, really good guy. Yep. And a real magician. He doesn't look like one, but he, 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 he plays the part. Yeah. I just I just look like uh, every stereotypical magician with the dark, slick, jet black hair and the goatee. All right. Folks, Andrew Zarian, thank Andrew, thanks, um, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks a lot. And folks, we'll be right back. And we're right back, I think. Let's check. Yep, right back. And Andrew was such so gracious to come on the show and spend so much time. We actually uh, had a false start on the on the recording of that one because we had some Skype issues that just were popping up with uh, some some feedback. So if you heard the audio volume fluctuate up and down, that was Skype kind of tuning things in and out. Uh, so. He was very gracious to continue the interview, even with a lot of feedback in his ear. You, you might have seen him adjusting his headset. And uh, is it one of the things that we talked about off air, and I wish we'd gotten it in the, in the interview, was uh, him using a, a, a visible mic and, and a visible headset, uh, more like a, a radio station kind of announcer than uh, a TV announcer. And he said you know, that that's something he had struggled with and uh, you know, wanted to know about the, the lavalier that I'm using and the, and the headsets that I'm, <laughs> that I'm using. And I was embarrassed to tell him that, you know, it, and by all means, don't tell Mike Phillips that this is, this is a secret just between you and me. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm using $9 earbuds that uh, actually I, I found out fit perfectly if you loop them over your ear and not go under your ear. And so it, 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 they're almost invisible. And uh, the lavalier is a, uh, a Radio Shack uh, $32 model, uh, at least until I can save up for the, the $200 road that, that uh, Phillips was telling me about. Um, but it's just, you know, it's, it's fine in what works. It's not the price tag that, that determines what's going to work. It really is what you've got up here in terms of knowing your, your hardware, knowing your software, knowing the limitations, knowing the strengths. And knowing where you can uh, do, where you can cheat a little bit one way and, and cheat back uh, a bit the other way. Um, anyway, um, I had intended to play some uh, some demos for you at this point, and as I mentioned earlier in the show, I forgot to include the audio on those, and I think I'm going to scrap them because they really are just uh, you know second rate without uh, without audio built in, and me trying to do a voiceover is is, is not going to be very successful. Um, but I did want to shift gears just slightly as we approach the end of the show and talk a little bit about uh, VidBlaster and one of the uh, things about VidBlaster that is not um, obvious to the eye. Um, and this has to do with uh, customized versions of VidBlaster. If you or, or someone you know of has a company that's interested in, in making VidBlaster part of, part of a product that they're selling, but not have the VidBlaster name on it, that is actually possible. It's a, it's a program in VidBlaster called OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturer. An OEM version of VidBlaster can be made that uh, basically takes out the VidBlaster name and puts in the name of your company or whatever name you want to put in it. Um, we can modify the program and take out certain features. So if you want a stripped down version of VidBlaster that only does certain things because you want your clients only to be able to stream to one particular server, for example, 
um, or have limited choices so that, uh, so that a, a, a licensee who is not particularly savvy can operate the program without being faced by too many choices. Um, I mean, obviously that's the, one of the beauties of VidBlaster is there are lots of things you can do with it and, and when you have lots of things, things become more complex. And so sometimes it's easier to sort of dumb it down by offering fewer choices. That can be done. Uh, there's a special fee for that and generally there's a minimum number of licenses that you would be asked to purchase. But if you're interested in that, please contact me, Tom, at that bitblasterguy.com. Um, also, would welcome you if you're watching this show live or, or on tape. On tape, I, I guess we can call it on tape. Everybody knows what you mean, at least for the next five years people will know. Uh, if you're watching this live or on tape, you can, uh, you can purchase a license from us for VidBlaster at any one of the four editions, the home, the pro, the uh, studio, or the broadcast. And we would be happy to, to sell that to you, and not just sell it to you, but it, more importantly, to help you get things plugged in and working. Um, all of my clients that uh, purchase a VidBlaster license from me get my email address, they get my cell phone, so if you're doing a broadcast on Tuesday afternoon at 2 o'clock Central Time, well, maybe that's not a good example because I'm going to be busy Tuesday afternoon uh, at Central Time doing this show. But if, you, uh, if you're having trouble or you need some assistance getting things going, you can pick up the phone and call. I get a call just about every day of the week from somebody that's either a past client or a potential client that says, Tom, how can I do this? Or, Tom, this is not working the way I want it to. Um, sometimes there, there are questions that are really simple. It's like, oh, by the way, yeah, that's a, that's a watermark. That means you didn't do your registration right. Let's talk about how to do the registration. And other times they're more complex about how to get certain cameras connected to a PC and working. Um, sometimes VidBlaster is the cheapest part of the whole process. You might spend uh, thousands of dollars on cameras or capture cards or other or, or mixers. Uh, sound equipment, and the vid blaster becomes the least expensive part of that process. But uh, sometimes I can help you with that other stuff too. So that's sort of a shameless plug uh, for me as a vid blaster reseller. Um, you can uh, here on our website that vidblasterguide.com. You can go to our store and uh, and purchase it. You, you you'll be switched to one of our sister websites, Sinclair Sports Network, where we do a lot of our sports broadcasting. Uh, and you can purchase it from the store. So, let's see, where are we here? We're just about out of time, and I think we're just about out of things to say. Oh, yeah, coming up uh, next week, haven't confirmed it yet, but I've been exchanging emails with Brian Brushwood, the, the musician, uh, musician, the, <laughs> the magician, and he has got, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, Google Brian Brushwood Scam School. Uh, it's really great. He'll, he teaches folks how to scam beers out of people at bars. I mean, obviously, you know, it's not something you want your teenagers to know about, but it, it really is a lot of funny, a lot of fun. And, and he's got uh, the Not Safe for Work uh, NSFW um, show that he comes. You can get to his website at swoodsherwood.com, um, um, and hopefully we'll, we'll have him on next week or the week after. Um, so that's it. For those of you that, that tuned in in the chat room live, we really appreciate you tuning in today. We're, we're glad you signed up with us. And for those of you that are watching us uh, on tape delay, uh, we hope you'll catch all our other episodes. You can actually see uh, our, our episodes on our website in the archives, or you can go to YouTube and do a search for VidBlaster Guy, and you'll see all of our episodes as well as our uh, tutorials. So we'll be adding some tutorials as time goes on. And if there's something in particular you'd like a tutorial on, uh, just drop me a note and I'd be happy to put one together for you. So this is Tom Sinclair with that VidBlaster guy. I hope to see you next Tuesday, 2 o'clock Central Time. And we'll send you out uh, with some VidBlaster guy theme music here. Well, 